In this final example, we'll show you how to find the, again, some critical points of another function and how to actually find the critical points by solving the system of equations that we end up with using Wolfram Alpha. So back up here, uh, we, we did some substitution. We solved the partial derivatives equal to zero simultaneously and found the point that's common to both of these equations. To do this in Wolfram Alpha, it's, it's quite simple. Uh, we'll go ahead and jump over to Wolfram Alpha and show you how to do that there. Solving the system in Wolfram Alpha is no more than no more complex than simply entering the two equations that we want to solve separated by a comma. Uh, so now I'll do 2y plus x equals 0 and I will press enter. And of course this is one of those steps where technology can do it just fine. Uh, the energy that we'll have to invest into solving some of these systems of equations can be quite expensive. And you can see here that you want to have, you want to be able to see these curly brackets around your two functions. This means the set of two functions. And then it gives me the solution here, x equals zero, y equals zero. If there's more than one, all those will be listed here as well. And those are our critical points. For this example, we can find our partial derivatives and our function is this guy here. And so we'll find our partials with respect to x and with respect to y to find our critical points. And the derivative of this guy with respect to x is going to be uh, 1x plus 0 plus 0 minus 3y. And then uh, plus 0 minus 9. And there's our partial with respect to x. Our partial with respect to y is going to be uh, 0 for the first term. It's going to be 9y squared for the second term, plus 9y, um, minus 3x, plus 9, minus 0. And so this is our set of uh, e equations here for the partials that we now need to set equal to 0. So I'll do x minus 3y minus 9 equals 0, and 9y squared plus 9y minus 3x plus 9 equals 0. And this is going to get a little bit cumbersome to try to solve because inevitably down here we're going to have a quadratic equation that we need to solve when we uh, if we were to solve for y and plug it in here, it's going to be a, a mess of equations to enter in. So I'm going to go ahead and, and to do the algebra on. So I'm going to go ahead and use Wolfram Alpha and show you what those critical points are. So here we can see the uh, input looks pretty good and we can see a plot of the solutions and because these are equations in terms of x and y, these can actually be found graphically by plotting the two functions and then uh, uh, locating those intersection points between our parabolic function and our linear function. And those are the two points given to us. If we scroll down to solutions, we can see that they don't come out to be perfect um, integers. But if we click on approximate form, that'll do. That'll get us close enough. So here are our two solutions, which we'll take over and now analyze to see whether those are each minima, maxima, or saddle points. So now that we have those, we're going to compute the partial, the, the, the second partial derivatives and the mixed partial derivative in order to be able to plug these two points in. So our de second derivative with respect to x is going to be, let's see, f sub x, x of x, y. Again, we could use Wolfram Alpha to compute this, but um, this is a pretty nice polynomial. So the derivative of x with respect to x is 1 minus 0 minus 0. And the partial with respect to y, the second derivative, is going to be, let's see, 9y squared, its derivative is going to be 18y plus 9 minus 0 plus 0. And you can see that now this is the first time that we've seen the second derivative come out to be a function as opposed to a constant. So we will need to substitute in our values. Now the derivative, the mixed partial, which is going to be the derivative of either of these two with respect to the other variable, you can see we'll get the same thing. But the derivative of this guy with respect to y is going to be negative 3. And so our d value is going to be um, 1 times 18y plus 9 minus a negative 3 squared, 
which comes out to 18y plus 9 minus 9, which is simply 18y. Okay, so this is where we now need to compute the d value for both of these two functions. And so for the critical point, x is about 4.76, negative 1.41. The d value is going to be, uh, well, I'm going to plug in, neg there's no position for x in here, but you can think about this as plus 0x. So um, really only the y value will affect the d that we get out of this equation. And negative 1.41 multiplied by 18 is going to be negative 25.38. And so now I can go back up to our table and we can see what to classify this point as. If d is less than 0, then f has a saddle point at that ordered pair. So this represents a saddle point so we can say that this is a saddle point. Now we'll take a look at the graph in just a moment, but we still have one more point to classify. We now need to look at the point 13.24, 1.41. And if I go ahead and plug in 1.41 for y and 13.24 for x, I'm going to get the same but opposite value, 25.38. And this is bigger than zero, so then I need to look at, uh, the, the constraint is if d is bigger than zero, you also need to look at the second partial with respect to x, which is always equal to one. So it's totally safe to say that at 13.24, 1.41, and actually at every single point, the output of this mixed partial right here is gonna be negative three, doesn't, doesn't matter the location. And so we see that d is bigger than zero, f sub x x at our critical point is less than zero. And so the conclusion that we can draw from that is to say, going back up to our table, d is bigger than zero and f sub x x is less than zero. So that's a local maximum. So this point is a local max. It is possible that what we call local ends up being a global as well, but unfortunately from the d-test alone, we cannot state whether these are global. So we often just call them local no matter what. Let's go ahead and take a look at the graph of this to confirm our results. So at x equals 4.76, which is right about here somewhere, and negative 1.4 in the y direction, which is Somewhere, somewhere about here, uh, we have our saddle point, and you can kind of see here that this way that function represents a maximum, but going this way, that function represents a minimum, and that justifies our classification of that point as being a saddle point. Now the point 13.24, which is 13 is somewhere over here, comma 1.41, which is somewhere over here, we have a local maximum. And uh, it's a little bit harder to see in our picture. And then entirely, uh, actually here, we obviously looks more like a minimum. So the graph actually helps us see that I made a mistake here. This should not be negative three. I don't know where I grabbed that value from. That should actually be a one. Um, and so this guy is bigger than zero. Therefore, we can say that this point is actually not a local max, but a local min. So let's go ahead and correct that. And just, these are good ways to justify that a point is in fact what you say it is. So 13.24, 1.41 is somewhere in this region here. We can see that that point represents a local min. So the visual representation justifies what the mathematics is saying. So one last question that we want to address here is what do we do when d equals zero? Well, a good strategy is to create a table, like an example two, which contains points surrounding the critical point in close proximity. For example, if x, y equals one, three were to be a critical point, make a table with say x equals 0.99 all the way to 
y is 2.99 all the way to 3.01 and compute the z values for all of these pairs, make a, a conclusion from the uh, the z values whether the point is a local minimum, local maximum, or saddle points. And so, you know, we would create our table much like we saw in example two, we'd have 0 0.99, 0 0.999, 1, 1.001, and 1.01. And then we'd have y values, let's say 2.99, 2.999, 3.01, 1.001, and 3.01. And then right in the center here, we have our actual z value for that critical point. And then we could look at all of these neighboring points to see whether this point is higher, lower, or maybe it's both in the sense that maybe it's highest, it's higher than going in the x direction, but it's lower when you're going in the y direction. And then you can make the conclusion that way to say, hey, you know what? I think this is a local max or it's a local min, or perhaps it's neither of the two. So with that said, uh, that concludes the this example and it concludes our study of critical points. Soon we'll get at how do we use this to solve real world problems.